Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is University of Memphis women's basketball coach Melissa McFerrin. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving, everyone, and welcome to the show. As we once again give thanks this holiday season, let me give thanks to all of you for allowing us to come into your homes each and every week. Now, tonight we check in on the University of Memphis women's basketball team, which split their first four games entering this week's action. Memphis recently dropped back-to-back -back encounters with Big Ten opponents, falling a week ago at Illinois by a bucket, and then dropping a six-point home decision to Minnesota last Sunday. Head coach Melissa McFerrin is in her seventh season as Memphis head coach. Last year, the Tigers snapped a streak of four straight seasons in the postseason. It's also been well over a decade since Memphis last played in the big one, the NCAA tournament. Today, Melissa McFerrin talks about the challenges that lie ahead as she tries to lead her team back into postseason play. And it's next on Sports Files. Melissa, thank you so much for, for being with us again. We, we really enjoy it, and I know you're very busy, so thanks again for your time. Happy to be here. All right, let's talk about this team off to a 2-2 two and two start. A couple of wins early, a couple of close shaves against Big Ten teams in which you lost by two at Illinois and by six against Minnesota. Games you, you could have easily won, but uh, how would you evaluate your team right now at this point, early in the season? We opened up our first game um, with Missouri State and felt like we had a pretty good effort, but... To be frank with you, for our first game, I was very displeased with our defensive efforts. So we went back, went to work on that, made some points to our team. In our second game against Sanford, I thought we really tidied things up. And we felt mm -hmm. great going in to our Big Ten week, so to speak. Um, Illinois and Minnesota both were just a game of a couple of possessions. And um, disappointed that we didn't come away with one of those two. I think the Illinois game was the game that uh, perhaps we... I hate to say could have or should have, but um, certainly could have won. And then Minnesota game, we came back here, had, a, had another very, very good effort. We won in every statistical category with the ex exception of shooting percentage. So we're continuing to grow. To answer your question, how do I feel? I feel good about our team, but I also know that we need to continue to make strides. If the goal of being in the top five or even the top four in the American Athletic Conference is to, is to come true. When it comes down to those final couple of possessions in a close game like it was in Illinois, and you need somebody to step up, does that happen through strictly experience, through leadership? How do you get one of these young ladies, or more hopefully, to step up and take that big shot, make that big shot, and win a game for you? Well, first of all, I think we have to show a lot of confidence in them. That's a tough place to be. That's a lonely place when you're the only one in the spotlight. Right. Um, but I definitely think Errol Hearn is one of those players that's willing to do that. I think Mariah Rouser is also. And I think from a defensive perspective, I think Bria Wilder Cochran is. And um, she made some late plays defensively in the game against Illinois that really put us in a position to perhaps win the game. So I think those three players um, are going to be the players right now that I would expect to come through in those very, very critical moments. Melissa, right now at this point, again, early in the season, what would you say the team's strengths are and things you need to really work on? I think our strength is that we now have a solid starting five. And when I say that, that's mm -hmm. no disrespect in the past or, or um, to our reserves, but right. we've, we're really solid. Our starting five is really, really solid. And then I think we can come off the bench with some scoring. Um, Taylor Williams can come off the bench and score for us. Um, uh, Bria Elmore can come off the bench and score for us. Courtney Powell can in some ways. So for the first time in maybe three years, I feel like we're really solid. We don't have a hole in our starting lineup. And um, I think we have a little bit of 
scoring that can come off the bench. Yeah, with that said, going back to just last season, you know that if somebody goes down with an injury, there's foul trouble, there's something else, maybe an off-the-court issue, that you're going to be thin, and that's an issue. And this year, obviously, you're a little bit deeper, a little bit more confident what you have in reserve. Without question. Um, we had a hole or two in our on our roster a year ago, and now we feel like we've pretty much taken care of that. Now, if we can continue to, as I say, grow up the right way, meaning our juniors now, even though we have no seniors, so our juniors now have to take the primary leadership role. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking to them a lot about the sense of urgency that's required when you don't have a senior on the roster that just naturally has that sense of urgency because right. their career is coming to an end. So we're spending a lot of time with our juniors right now really trying to, to instill in them that we don't want to miss an opportunity just because we know we're going to have another year next year with the same group. That's a good point. Now, with that said, no senior, but you got a little core group that's back. You have three starters from a year ago back, six letter winners. You also have six newcomers. So how hard has it been to try to mesh? We have really great team chemistry right now. Our, our players like each other. I think our underclassmen respect our upperclassmen. And so we've had no issues in that. But now comes the time when those young juniors, I'll call them, now have to, um, they have to be the driving force behind this team. And that is a very new role for them. They have been the scores and the performers, but they haven't been the driving force behind the team. Mm -hmm. The the force that, that, that deals with the fundamentals of who we are as a team on the court, off the court, from a defensive standpoint, from a rebounding standpoint, um, from an execution standpoint. So they now are taking on that leadership role, so to speak, and, and beginning to understand how critical that is for us going forward to be a very good basketball team. People who follow your team, they know about Ariel, Ariel who you mentioned, Mariah, who's off to a great start this season, Asia. Brianna Wright, tell me about this young lady. She's uh, putting some good numbers up. Excited about Brianna Wright. She is that forceful, aggressive post player um, that can really do a number of things. She's a great offensive rebounder. She is a space eater. She loves to post. She gets great position. She owns a lot of real estate when she's in the paint asking for the basketball. Very nice touch around the basket. And from a chemistry standpoint, has just fallen into our team and, and is showing that she's very, very comfortable with our team, even though she hasn't been with us very long. But we're, we're expecting her to be a double-double player mm -hmm. nearly every night. And I think if, if we're not able to get her there, then I, will have feel like, I, will, I've, I feel like we will have let her down. It's good to own a lot of real estate, I've, I've been told. Owning real estate's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about some of these newcomers. Uh, also to the staff, David Midlick, uh, Delta State head coach, played ball at Ole Miss. What does he bring to the table? Well, first of all, he's a, he's a Memphis guy. He is from Memphis, um, grew up here, went to Christian Brothers High School. He, he knows a lot more history about the Tigers than I do, mm -hmm. um, going back to the early days of, of the basketball team's, men's basketball team's success here. So um, in many ways, he's much more familiar than I am with Memphis and with the high school coaches and with the community. Um, but what he really brings to us is just a, he's a great tactician. He's a very, very sound defensive basketball coach. David's a great human being and going to be a great role model for our players. And we are a basketball team, but we're still about developing young people as well. And so he's, uh, he's got a great set of eyes. Um, he can watch practice and he can watch a game. And he sees it differently than I do, but he sees a lot and makes great suggestions. And he's, he's been a head coach, so he understands how to motivate a team. And well, well let me valuable. ask you this. You, you are a head coach. You've been a head coach for quite some time. At Memphis, you're in your seventh year. You have ways that you want to do things offensively, defensively, what this team is all about. When your coaching staff, especially a newcomer, mm -hmm. um, comes up with something different, how do you react to something like that? Are you very open with what they have to bring to the table? Well, you, first of all, just to set the stage, um, now over the last four years, I have lost my top assistant right. each year of the last four years. And so... Doesn't that mean you, you're doing something well? Well, the program? I, I hope so. Well, right? I hope it doesn't mean I'm running them off. But I, don't, <laughs> I don't think that's the case. I don't think They've so. They've all gone on to great opportunities. But right. that has been our defensive coordinator position. And so 
when that turns over year after year, sometimes you lose a little bit because uh, managing a basketball team is a big job. And I largely have turned that responsibility over to, to our associate head coach. So David now comes in with a wealth of experience. And like I said, having been a head coach, he's made those decisions. Mm -hmm. And I trust him. So if I don't turn a lot over on the defensive side of the basketball to David, then I'm not doing my job because he's very talented and, and very experienced. And that's how great basketball staffs are built. We all take on our own little part and make it well, make it, make it work out well. When you roll out the ball and, and you say, let's go, let's get ready for this game, using a football term, who's your, who's your quarterback out there? Who's the vocal leader? And is it important to have that type of leader in the game of basketball? It is. It's Ariel Hearn. Um, she is that type of leader. Um, she was kind of a goofy little freshman and, um, and a sophomore that was starting to have some goals. But now as a junior, you can really see her mature mm -hmm. and develop. Mariah Rouser is kind of the quiet one that um, our players, when she talks, our players listen. And then and Bria Wilder Cochran is, is our up and coming young voice. Very, very solid, very trustworthy. But without a question, at this moment, it's Errol Hearn that, that circles them up and gets them fired up and shows the most emotion and has a very, very high level of commitment to this game and this team. Hearn's also local, Arlington High School. You have a nice mixture of young ladies that come from around the country. You do recruiting, of course, nationally. Uh, how is the local prep scene in Memphis? Well, the local prep scene in Memphis has always had great talent. Um, unlike the men's team, I don't think we have as much depth in the high school talent here in Memphis, but we always have one or two very, very national level players here in Memphis. And so we continue to strive to sign that best player in Memphis. Um, at times we've gotten that player like an Ariel Hearn year, and at, at right. times we haven't. But uh, as we continue to grow this program, and I guess now in year seven, I say we're still growing and maturing. And in many ways, I feel like this is my second year here mm -hmm. because it's the second year in a new conference. And it really is True. resetting the stage and trying to grow now in a new conference. Feels like second. In reality, it's seven. So let me <laughs> ask you this. How have you changed from year one at Memphis? And you were a head coach, of course, before mm -hmm. that. But from Memphis, year one to year seven. Um, I think I, when I came to Memphis, I think I had a very, very great vision of where we could go and what we could accomplish. And I think I was able to convey that vision to our team. And, and they had tremendous buy-in. And I think um, early on in our recruiting, we sold a vision. We didn't really have a program to sell at that point. So we mm -hmm. sold the vision, the experiences of our coaching, our coaching staff and, and the goals that our players had to be professional level players. And, now it's it's a different it's a different time and it's a different stage now, um, and I think now we have an opportunity to sell the facilities that we have um, built in in about the last five or six years, um, and now we we create that new vision of who we have to become. So I don't know that I've changed much. The players will tell you that I have. The old ones will tell you that I'm softer now. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that are here will tell you I'm still pretty hardline. But I don't, I don't think as a coach you really change your stripes. I, I try to take time to get to know our players and at what, what motivates them and care about them on a level that goes beyond being a basketball player. So I don't know that I've changed that much, but I think the vision here has changed because the program and our situation has changed so much, and certainly our conference has changed. It's interesting because it's a correlation to what Justin Fuente is going through with the football team. Took over, there wasn't much there. You took over, there wasn't much there. You've had to have time to build it which you have done, and that's what he's doing with football. You had the run. You got four years in, in a row in the postseason. Mm -hmm. Now you got to get back. Yeah. Uh, how important is it this year to be playing in the postseason? It's important. Uh, we took a step back last year, not so much because we took a step back, but because we took a step up. Um, I think if we had played in Conference USA a year ago, we would have been a top four finisher. Right. Uh, but we're not in that league any longer. And I've said many times it was a bad year to be young and a bad year to be thin, uh, <laughs> the year that we made that move. But, but that's what it was. And, and I do think that this year we're going to see some of the benefit of that, even against an Illinois or a Minnesota, which we can liken very much to our American Athletic Conference opponents. Uh, we saw a different level of competitiveness, and we saw a different 
level of focus out of our team. So I think last year, when you get your ears pinned back a little bit like we did last year with some of the American teams, it gets your attention. It's not a feeling that you enjoy. And and so it getting back to postseason is our goal this year. Right. And our and our players will tell you that very openly. We talk about it um, nearly daily. And even losing a program like Louisville and like Rutgers, an East Carolina mm -hmm. team comes in undefeated as we talk, uh, South Florida, and then of course it all starts with, with Geno and Connecticut. So there are a lot of obstacles still, even with the loss of those two teams I mentioned. Without question. Um, UConn is obviously the class of our conference. They're the class of the nation, um, even though they've dropped one game this year already. But the entire nation is chasing UConn. They're, they've been in a different category the last few years. Louisville is a very, very high-level loss, and they have signed a tremendous recruiting class. They're going to be good for a number of years. But if you take Louisville out of the equation, I think that Tulane, um, in particular in East Carolina also, can, can nearly be a Rutgers-level team. Um, East Carolina is very, very good right now, uh, had five starters back, added two junior college players that are, are going to boost their roster and their production. Tulane has a team of all five seniors that are starters. And uh, if you remember, that would have been four years ago coming up, right. that they won or went to the finals of the Conference USA with largely freshmen. Those freshmen are now seniors. Wow. So, we lost some teams, but the, at least two of the teams that we brought in are, are going to be very high-level teams. Less than a minute to go, something we talked about last year when we sat down here on Sports Files. You've really pushed very hard to make the facilities better. There's mm -hmm. still a ways to go, but how confident you feel that the, you got the backing? And talk mm -hmm. about the progress. About 40 seconds. Great progress. Locker room's done, has been done for three years. Weight room and training facility are first class. We just upgraded the visitor locker room. Um, the one change that we have to make is the arena that we play in, and we love the Elmeroon Fieldhouse, um, but that, that has got to be the final upgrade, and that's no secret. Uh, we all know that, and uh, we just hope there are some plans in place to make that happen. A lot of history with Elmeroon Fieldhouse. But it is an old arena. It's been around a long time, and it is 2014. So, so hopefully something will happen in, in the not-too-distant future. In the meantime, it is your home. So obviously, it's a nice home court advantage to have. Hopefully, the, the uh, fans will get out there and support you. And we always appreciate it. You know we're, we're, we're rooting for you, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care. We'll take a short break. Overtime is next. The Salvation Army Croc Center has been open in Memphis for less than two years, and it's already made quite an impact. The $32 million facility is over 104,000 square feet and currently is home to over 9,000 members. Of course, it has all the modern amenities you want in a fitness center, but the Croc Center is much more than a great place to get or stay in shape. It's an educational center, a place to learn, a recreation facility where families and friends can gather to swim, play a game of hoops, or soccer, or even taking a play. It's a place to worship, a place to take in the arts, and a place that provides programs throughout the year for children and adults. And yes, it's a place that is for everyone. Recently, I had a chance to take the grand tour with Captain John Rich, the Memphis area commander for the Salvation Army. Captain, here at the Salvation Army Croc Center, there, there's four areas of concentration, not only here, but at all the Croc Centers. What are they? They're the arts, recreation, education, and worship. Okay, so we are here part of the recreation, and that's, that's across right. this, this this massive uh, swimming facility. Tell us about what you have to offer recreation-wise. Yeah, we're really committed in these croc centers to ministering to the whole person, so body, soul, mind, spirit, and certainly all of our recreation fitness areas are, are dedicated to that. We have experts in the field. You can see a number of them teaching swimming lessons now. We taught swimming lessons to hundreds of children and seniors and, and adults since we've been open. Lap lanes, those kinds of things. We have an NBA-sized basketball court here that gets a ton of use. It also serves as a large group 
fitness exercise where Zumba and all kinds of different classes. Uh, we have a number, 80 different classes of group exercise that happen in this facility every week that's part of a membership package that we offer the community. So literally hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people uh, per week are, are being uh, exercised here in, in very effective ways, learning how to eat right, learning how to exercise and, and really strengthen their, their bodies so that many of them are getting off medications for the first time in their life, et cetera. So it's really a, a community asset in the whole recreation fitness area. We have indoor soccer courts as well, where we have indoor soccer leagues, we play indoor lacrosse there. We have outdoor NCAA size soccer fields outside as well, as well as a big splash pad. And we have a state-of-the-art fitness center where we have personal trainers on site at all time. We have state-of-the-art treadmills and rowing machines, free weights, uh, you name it. Uh, and, and we have that kind of facility here. Captain, we talked about education. I don't remember this when I grew up going to school. What is this place? This is called the Challenge Center, and there are lots of challenges that kids can work through in, in teamwork, problem solving, those kinds of things. Lots of gizmos and gadgets, interactive things that they can do to learn uh, about their community, learn about the world, learn what it means to work together with others to accomplish tasks. They go into these rooms here, and that's yep. exactly what they do? Yeah, there's a disaster room, there's a doctor's office room, there's all kinds of rooms in there where they're given different tasks to complete. Not only is this particular facility here at the Salvation Army Croc Center used to educate, but there are other things as well. Plenty of programs, not only for kids, but for adults as well. Yeah, this space is often used by corporate groups for team building. We have classrooms where there's classes on nutrition. We have a demonstration kitchen where people can learn about how to cook um, in a nutritious way. Uh, classrooms for the arts, classrooms for uh, continuing education, GED. So there's lots of education going on in this building. Something for everyone. Captain, I know the arts is extremely important to you. We are here at the Junior League of Memphis Art Exhibit Hall. There are paintings throughout this hallway by local artists. It's absolutely terrific. Tell us why you have this. Yeah, well, art's just a really important part, I think, of, of any community in, in all of its forms. And so here we have the visual arts, and, and these exhibits are local artists, and it rotates every couple of months or so throughout the year. So it's just a beautiful thing to see when you walk in. People can purchase this art if they want it. A portion goes to the Croc Center to support, to support our ministry. But there's also a commitment to the performing arts here as well. We have many productions and, and musical kinds of things, tap dance lessons, um, uh, workshops on, on how to how to design fashions. I mean, it's just an amazing array of arts on display here that you can learn or that you can show. Um, various performing groups come in here and use our facility to, to share their art with the community. Well, you mentioned the theater. Why don't we head to the theater? That'd be great. Okay. Well, here we are in this beautiful theater. Tell us about it, Captain. Yeah, it really is beautiful. We have 300 seats, and we've had many productions in here since we opened. Everything from Godspell to Jesus Christ Superstar to Annie, uh, many other outside organizations have come and used this. It's really been a well-used space. So Broadway shows on a local scale, but we also know that this facility is used on Sundays because we get to our fourth element of what the Salvation Army Croc Center is all about, and that's faith. Yeah, that's right. We have a worshiping community here, a church congregation that meets here on Sunday mornings. It's a small congregation of about 100 or so people. Uh, they have Bible studies throughout the week that we offer really to the public, anyone who wants to explore in that way. And so it really is a fully functioning church congregation within the walls of the Croc Center. Well, Captain, we've come full circle with recreation. We're in your spacious fitness center. It's been a terrific tour. And I know you have a great membership, but you wouldn't mind more people coming out here and, and checking out the facility. Sure, this facility is really for the whole city. And so if you haven't checked us out, we'd invite Memphis to come and check us out. We give tours throughout the day. Just come in, check in at the front desk and ask for a tour. Someone will show you around. I think we do have a lot to offer, so, so come and visit us. You guys are doing great work. The Salvation Army has always been doing great work for many, many years. Thank you so much for your time yeah, for thank the tour. You. Thank you, Greg. We appreciate, appreciate it. it. And our thanks once again to Captain John Rich. Couple of notes before we go. The Memphis Tigers football team will go after their sixth straight win on Saturday when they play host to UConn at 3 p.m. If the Tigers can get the W, it would make it nine wins and give them no worse than a share of the American Athletic Conference title with a 7-1 and one record. 
Also, a spot in the first ever FBS playoff will be on the line for Mississippi State this Saturday when they face rival Ole Miss in the annual Egg Bowl in Oxford. The Rebels' chance at a playoff spot went up in smoke last Saturday when they lost at Arkansas 30 to nothing, giving the Hogs six wins and bowl eligibility. And speaking of six wins, Tennessee needs to defeat Vanderbilt on Saturday to also qualify for a bowl game. And the Memphis Tigers basketball team is in action tonight in Las Vegas facing Baylor. The Tigers will also play tomorrow before returning home Tuesday night to face Stephen F. Austin, which will be our first telecast of Tigers replay games right here on WKO. As for Sports Files, we will be back with you on a special day and time for most of the month of December, and that includes next Friday, December 5th at 7.30 p.m. So until we talk to you Tuesday for the Tigers and next Friday here on Sports Files, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO.